It's not calling you Josh Frydenberg, it's calling you Dosh Frydenberg. Under the coalition, taxes for hard-working Australians will always be lower. You know, I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit your control room. They're answers that only can come from Victoria, I'm afraid, because that's not my job. But I ain't spending any time, though, because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. Good day, listeners, and welcome once again to the Two Jacks, where we discuss all matters Australian and then go overseas and have a good look around there too. And joining me, as usual, all the way from Hong Kong, is Hong Kong Jack. And it's a special day for Jack. It's his birthday. Happy birthday, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not, not a raise to that sort of birthday, just a, um, a good to see the scoreboard ticking over birthday. You know. Just a quick single. Yeah, just a to, quick single. Uh, just turn one off the hip and, uh, and stroll through for a single. And how are things in Hong Kong? I believe you had uh, a second typhoon. We did. Uh, we did. We sort of petered out into a tropical storm, but we had what we call uh, the rain signals here. You get an amber or a red or occasionally a black rain signal. The black rain signal is a bit like the typhoon warning. Black rain means the schools close, businesses close public transport stops, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this was a big one. Um, uh, hit a, Enormous black, amount of rain. The black rain hit at about 11 o'clock last Thursday night um, and in the next hour we had 160-odd millimetres of rain um, uh, in my part of town. 6.2 um, inches I've got here. Yep, um, uh, six inches in the old. In, um, uh, in the space of what? An hour, hour, an hour. Um, uh, I uh, we've got a nice sheltered balcony here, and I uh, had my wife was away, had cooked dinner, took a glass of wine, stood out in the balcony and watched it tumble down. I've never seen rain like it. Well, you want to build an ark with that sort of rain? Yeah, you? yeah be gather, gathering the cockroaches and pears, yeah, mate. You know, that's, you, it's always a difficulty in you know that cubit. Yeah, cubit, yeah. yeah how many cubits <laughs> to a meter, and it's very difficult. <laughs> Very yeah. difficult. So don't uh, don't follow the Bible. Don't follow the Old Testament. Uh, you yeah. will go wrong. Um, I, think, I think it was twenty inches for the for the twenty four hours. Wow. Well, see, sixteen inches of rain over twenty four hours in the North Libyan city of Bida um, has caused massive flooding uh, there. Um, uh, over two thousand people dead. Many more missing. Dams collapsed. Roads collapsed. Um, and. Uh, uh, you've had at least that amount of rain, but in that particular part of the world, it's caused untold havoc. Um, uh, and uh, that uh, that uh, the, the flooding in uh, northern Libya is just sort of breaking news as we record this. Uh, it mm. sounds like a uh, huge humanitarian disaster and comes on top of another one uh, in North Africa with a Moroccan earthquake with... Uh, some uh, 3,000 dead there, many more missing, um, in and around Marrakesh. Uh, had some friends uh, who were in Marrakesh at the time. Uh, they were uh, they uh, were in a hotel. They were, they were safe uh, and now looking to get out of the country. They've basically been told, yes, you need to leave. Um, and uh, what, uh, what's left there is uh, heartbreaking for uh, the Moroccan people and um, and. and, and and, and uh, around the world as well. And it's just a reminder to our listeners that if you want to donate, if you can donate to either of these uh, uh, humanitarian disasters, uh, probably the best is Red Crescent or Medicine Sans Frontier. And uh, if you can weigh in a few bucks towards uh, 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 easing the misery in those two places, uh, uh, you'll feel better about it and uh, they'll get a fair bit out of it themselves. And Jack, the voice is upon us. Uh, we're not. Uh, we're a month or so away from the big day, and the polling is looking pretty ordinary, isn't it, for the Yes campaign? Um, I'll just quickly go over the state breakdowns. Uh, 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 this is uh, from um, uh, this is the Redbridge Group, um, but it, it it it's all falling into line with other polls, including News Poll. You've got uh, uh, and with and with resolve the nine um, network no, there's, polls there's, yeah, and there's essential. Really no, all all yeah. the polls are the same. Yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're, they're saying pretty much the same things. Um, well, let's start in the west. WA yes thirty nine no sixty one. Um, 
South Australia, uh, yes, 41, no, 59. Queensland is the same as Western Australia. That's uh, 61, no, yes, 39. New South Wales uh, and Victoria both were sort of leading the yes vote uh, just, a, just a month or two ago. Now New South Wales is at 56, no, uh, yes, 44. Uh, Victoria's flicked over into the minority. Uh, uh, the yes has a proposition has flipped over to the minority uh, now. That is no 51, yes 49. And it's only in uh, little old Tasmania where the yes vote is 56, 44 on the polling. As I say, as you said, Jack, uh, not a lot of change uh, in those figures depending on whichever poll you look at. Uh, at, at the moment, uh, if things went really well for the S campaign and they started campaigning a bit better, they might win two states. They might win three, but they can't win the referendum. It doesn't look that way at all, does it? So um, let's look at the shift here, Jack. And some of this you, 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 you will have to attribute to uh, a, a poor campaign. So the Yes proposition was sitting... Uh, in around um, the early part of 2022, at uh, at around 65 or 60, just below 65 percent, um, that was its all time high in October 2022. Just got up to about 64 percent, and now it's at 43 percent. The crossover came in around about July of this year. Uh, and uh, those numbers are coming down. Now, the, we can talk about the campaign, and we will, uh, and uh, some of the issues that have arisen there, but the, uh, the other thing that we've got there that we must, you know, we must include in, into it is this, um, uh, when, when the yes and no basically crossed over in June of this year, that was pretty much the time when... Uh, when the coalition, not so much the National Party, but the Liberal Party under Peter Dutton, decided that they were going to oppose it. So that's when the crossover actually occurred. Yeah, um, but this, this, this was never going to win. Firstly, because the proposal is poor um, uh, and it was never going to be able to be kicked over the line. Um, uh, secondly, I don't think you can blame Peter Dutton for this, and indeed, you said earlier this year that every time he opened his mouth and spoke about the referendum, the no vote went down and the yes vote went up. And I think you're probably pretty right about that. So I don't think you can shoot any blame home to them. Um, the real problem is, is with the proposal itself and with the yes campaign, they've both been appalling. Yes. I, I, it, it's important, I think, for people to remember that this is not really a party um, a political party exercise. Um, no, it's and, not. No, it's not. And and, uh, uh, and and well, Labor support the voice, and many members of the uh, the parliamentary Liberal Party uh, oppose it. Um, there are uh, people on both sides who, uh, uh, who, 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 particularly in the Liberal Party, must be said, the former uh, um, uh, the former Indigenous Affairs. Spokesperson Julian Lisa, among others, have supported it. The problem has been a pretty awful campaign, and one of the reasons is that people have fixated supporters of the yes proposition, and we're not talking about Indigenous communities necessarily, um, but um, those people who support the yes proposition have, have been very quick to label uh, those on the other side as racist. And that's really not the way to go about things for the for a start. But and it's also patently untrue. Yes, there will be a racist element among the no vote. There's no doubt about that. But it's not the preponderance. And when we're talking about essentially about a sort of fifty six forty four proposition, so fifty six percent of Australians aren't racist. We can't we aren't racist and hold racist views about Indigenous Australians. That, that's just not right. I mean, the other thing about the Redbridge poll, I had a good deep, deep dive on that. Um, people are capable of holding two ideas in their head at the same time. Um, 
They don't like the referendum, but they're not going to vote for the Liberal and National Party. So it's not a party political thing at all. I mean, Labor's vote's holding up pretty well. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on Elbow. Elbow's got some problems, but and that will have a small impact on Labor. But people aren't, people aren't going to vote against Labor because of the referendum. Um, people are voting against the referendum because they don't like it. There might be a little bit more um, consequences too for the no vote, and we'll talk about George Mega's piece uh, in the in the fair fa- oh, sorry the nine papers um, in the uh, monthly that was I think no it was in the monthly thank you it was um, uh, and uh, yeah we'll have a talk about that uh, because I did re- I did read the piece um, I think George was working for for nine but maybe he's moved on from that and there is something. Uh, you know, George is a very thoughtful commentator, and there might be something there. But the idea that those who vote no are instinctively racist is 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 a real nonsense. There is, of course, I mean, one, one to- of the th- there has been a clever way around this. Um, I've noticed on Twitter um, of some of the sillier um, yes proponents who say, well. Not everyone who votes no is a racist, but all the racists are going to vote no. And that's just a polite way of calling the people who vote no racists. So that's a really bad idea as well. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things we, we also have to um, acknowledge is that there is a no vote within Indigenous communities, particularly in and around the Lydia Thorpe activism uh, in indigenous in indigenous politics around the country, um, Lydia Thorpe has been very open about uh, um, uh, about uh, uh, not supporting the yes proposition, uh, <coughs> and uh, and she believes that uh, there should be a, a completely different process that starts with treaty. It's hard to see your way through that. But there is this sort of what I would call hard left element uh, that opposes uh, uh, that opposes the referendum as well. Her support's niche support, but it's real. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure what. Well, <laughs> trying to make sense of Lydia's thoughts, uh, <laughs> um, uh, either uh, her written pieces or her. Uh, or her uh, verbal expressions in and outside the parliament is uh, probably a, a fool's caper. But um, there are, in fact, already these treaty um, arrangements being made in virtually all states, not Western Australia so far, but Western Australia does have a history of, uh, of uh, putting together a treaty with... Uh, with the uh, indigenous peoples in and around south, uh, south, uh, uh, the southwest of the state, the, the, uh, there is a, these, there is a, a southwest agreement. I think it's called um, uh, already, which is that's with the Nunga people. Yes, yeah, that's, that's right. That's actually that actually worked fairly well. Yes. Um, then they tried it on a broader scale and made a complete pig's breakfast of it. So, um, uh, you know, these these things are a bit trial and error. You've got to try them out and see whether they're going to work or not. Well, but I understand these things are going ahead in Victoria. I understand that these things are going ahead in South Australia. They may have just been um, paused somewhat in South Australia um, when there's a referendum uh, due in South Australia, Jack, uh, on the voice uh, that has been uh, delayed uh, while the federal referenda, referendum goes ahead. Um, uh, and, and so treaty uh, as this kind of... Um, Unknown. I, I don't think you know this unknown and fearful sort of issue. People coming to take your backyards and and all that sort of stuff. I, I don't think that's really um, been uh, uh, much of a, an influence on what we see as a sort of disappearing support for for the uh, for the yes proposition. No, nor do I. Um, I, <coughs> I think the that, yes that'll can- pick up your racists, that sort of stuff. But yeah, but, but they're not going to change their minds anyway. Yeah, they're relatively few. Um, uh, the, the yes campaign has misunderstood all the way through why people don't like the proposal. It's yeah, but I mean, well, let's let's uh, just speculate. What would have happened to the yes to the yes vote or to the referendum itself had? Um, uh, it received bipartisan support. It would still have failed. You think so? Absolutely. Tell me why. I, well, I thought this was going. Well, I, I said this would fail at Christmas, um, when when it was still 
55 or 52 percent to 40 something percent, I still thought it would fail because it's a dog of a product to sell. Easy to knock off through a negative campaign? No, not just that. Um, uh, it, 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 does a, it does a couple of things. First, <clears throat> it doesn't really unite the country. It says um, 5% of the country are going to have sort of this entitlement, right? Um, and people just don't like that. Um, and, and all, all of the, the testing and things tell you the same thing. Secondly, it's ambiguous. You really can't tell how it's going to work. Um, and ambiguity, his history tells us this in Australia, any ambiguity in the proposal is death. <clears throat> and not even the yes proposal, I mean, yes proponents can agree exactly how it's going to work. Um, and, and that was a poor idea. Um, third, it was overreach. Um, it just went too far. It gave it its own chapter in the Constitution. Uh, and you couldn't really tell how that was going to work. All we know is probably the High Court will decide how it's going to work in the end. So that was all reasons, that was all going to come out. So even before Christmas when, yes, we're still well in front, it seemed obvious to me that it wasn't going to work. And then I kept having conversations with people who are progressive Australians um, who um, uh, you would expect to support um, a, a recognition proposal for Aboriginal people. And as soon as you made a joke about it and they realised they could tell you that, no, they didn't support the proposal as it was, they were keen to do so. They weren't saying so publicly, but one of the advantages of being an expat is people know they're not going to be sitting across the dinner table from you next week. So you can tell them things you don't tell everybody else. Um, and, I, and I understood even then that the support for yes was very, very soft, that there were a lot of people who were saying yes, but they weren't going to vote yes. What about the support of corporate Australia? We, we know, you know, the Qantas thing is almost a stain. But the the support of corporate <coughs> Australia, I would have thought, it's, it's certainly the way it pans out, is that it's that um, uh, it, it's actually proposing. Like a lot of these corporations are unpopular with Australia. Qantas probably be the best example at the moment. But the, getting the support of corporate Australia is almost actually been uh, a retrograde step. Um, yeah, and it happens for the wrong reason. It's, it happens because people at the top of major companies and sports organisations and celebrities and all those people, they think everyone's going to support yes because they don't know anyone who, who, who would vote no or who would tell them they're going to vote no. That's because they live in a bubble. Um, and, you know, they don't talk to their customers, they don't talk to their fans um, uh, and they got it, got it completely wrong. All right. Um, I mean, it's it just it's just absurd that all these major custom, all these major organisations, be they banks or um, football codes or whatever, um, uh, are out there spruiking something that a majority of their fans don't agree with. A majority of their fans and customers don't agree. Well, our good friend Ray. From Tweed Heads, known as Bass Man to us, he's uh, suggested that the only way for the yes folk to get up is for Peter Dutton and Anthony Anthony Albanese to debate each other before a panel of journalists in the last week of their campaign. It would certainly add interest and expose any misinformation from both sides. What do you think, Jack? Um, I can't imagine why uh, either of them would want to do it. Um, exactly right. I don't think, uh, yeah, I can't see either one of them being very keen to do that. And, and it certainly is certainly Elbow say, won't, Elbow won't because it's a loser, um, uh, now. Um, uh, and he won't, he won't, be, he'll be keeping his hands off it as much as he can, I would think. Um, and Peter Dutton, I don't think, I don't think there's much upside for him in it either. Um, look, and this brings us to the Chris Mitchell column in the Australian uh, yesterday as we record this. We're recording on the 12th of uh, September. Um, uh, he wrote a column which uh, made a great deal of sense. And, of course, Chris, as uh, editor-in-chief of the Australian for many, many years, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, was always uh, pushing the, the issue of uh, Indigenous Australians and um, perhaps more than any other media organisation. So uh, he's talked about uh, about Pearson's sort of changed tone. No, of course, Noel Pearson, I'm saying. Uh, Pearson discussing his decades of work on rights and responsibilities in Cape York said, uh, 
in, in, until we take responsibility, there'll be no turnaround in closing the gap. You think my mob, this is Noel, like it when I talk about responsibility. They love it when I talk about rights and how they've been victimised. They don't like it when I say take responsibility for your children. No, nobody's going to save you until you get your family together. And Chris goes on to say, it's not what Albo's mates in the ALP left are used to hearing, but it is what middle Australia thinks. And few, yes, Aboriginal leaders can speak that language of personal responsibility. And this is why I'm a supporter of The, of, of, uh, the Voice, Jack, because I, I think the, the Voice is not this sort of ceremonial group uh, that, uh, that advises government in a kind of passive way that this is actually a form of accountability that we're actually making the uh, uh, it, it, the voice itself accountable for some of the some of the issues that uh, that arise through indigenous australia uh, particularly in remote and rural areas yeah I will, so I, I don't think the voice does do that um, or it's unclear whether it will do that i mean it might but I don't think I think it probably won't. I mean, the, the sort of thing Noel Pearson's talking about that, that Chris Mitchell quotes is very similar to what Mar Warren Mundine says about what will fix remote um, uh, um, in uh, re remote Aboriginal disadvantage, which is huge. And and credit to Chris Mitchell, he's done a fair bit to expose that um, uh, and bring attention to it. Um, you know, but Warren Mundine talks about you know the the need for some kind of um, uh, property rights, the need to um, uh, uh, families need to get kids to school every day, all that sort of stuff. And that's true. That will make a big, big difference. And it's not happening. But I don't see that there's much of a link between that and a national voice. That's a t that, what you're talking about there is, is micro uh, voices, if you like. Um, uh, the people in that community um, uh, are working hard to try and make it better. For f I've been watching this for 35 years. And talking to people who've been involved, political people who've been involved in Aboriginal affairs, ministers, etc., and there are three things there's been no shortage of in that time. One is goodwill, two is money, and three is consultation. There's been lots of all of it, and it's not made a blind bit of difference so far. Well, this is, uh, I'll just quote uh, Chris <coughs> again, and this has the support of Noel. The question Albanese will not want to face, and few urban Aboriginal activists will even contemplate, is whether the only slim path to a yes vote now lies in harnessing voter anger against politicians who have failed Aboriginal Australia and wasted hundreds of billions of dollars doing so. Uh, Albanese could not lead such a strategy. I don't think anyone in government really could, or who had been in government uh, really could. There's been a hell of a lot of good people. I mean, we talk about ministers who failed the Aboriginal community. Yes, what they've done has failed. There's been some really good people who've worked very hard with a hell of a lot of goodwill, and it hasn't worked. It is time to rethink how that works. I just don't think the voice... Um, uh, uh, can carry that weight. I don't think it can do that job. Well, here's a voice from one of our listeners, Harry. Um, uh, Jack, uh, uh, an opinion that I would say uh, uh, comes from the progressive left. I hope I'm not uh, uh, besmirching you there, Harry, but but that's kind of what I feel from 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 your contributions previously. And this is what Harry has to say. Read the voice. I will probably vote yes, but I have gnawing misgivings. I read the voice code. Uh, I read the voice co-design final report. I know the Uluru statement details. I'm concerned about national sovereignty of, and the federation. I think the voice is an embryonic first nation state. I worry that it sounds fair when it is minimised, but it is the tip of the sphere of separatism masquerading as simple recognition, cloaking self-determination. Given that the Commonwealth is a federation of states and the voice will have elected, not appointed representatives drawn from communities based on known title First Nations country, it is my opinion that the voice will possess a, polit a potential political legitimacy equivalent in many minds to the will of the people. Uh, and he goes on to say that essentially you'll have 3% uh, of the population um, <coughs> uh, uh, that uh, potentially could fracture national sovereignty 
uh, and combined with existing land rights laws and precedents, the voice will effectively be a parallel state of just three percent of the population. Jack, what do you think of that? Um, well, I think that quite a, quite a lot of people think something similar to that. Um, or you know, this is what I'm saying. People don't like it because it doesn't unite us; it divides us. I think that's a that's the opinion of a lot of people. Now, you can tell me that you can say they're wrong, and maybe they are, but that's how they feel about it. Um, I read in this morning's paper in the Australian. Um, that um, uh, Labor MPs are now saying that they never really liked the proposal when it was put to them. Um, and I wonder how much real good cabinet consultation took place before this was put to the public. Um, because um, I would have thought if you had a cabinet of um, a, a dozen or 20 people sitting around, um, there'd be quite a number of them who would say, this is, a, this is an absolute dud of a proposal. We won't be able to get it up. All right. Now, political consequences, Jack. And as you mentioned before, George Mega, uh, former colleague of mine, terrific bloke, uh, wrote in the monthly about those things, political consequences beyond the referendum. And he uh, concludes his column by saying the political cliche that demography is destiny is misplaced. Political parties do not need to be overwhelmed by the rise of voters beyond their tribe. They can choose to embrace them by engaging with them as fellow Australians. Otherwise, demography does indeed become fate. In choosing to campaign against the voice on behalf of a shrinking part of the electorate, Dutton risks turning the party of Menzies, which governed Australia for 51 of the past 74 years, into a protest party of permanent opposition. Jack, what do you think of that? Um, I... uh I, I don't think that's right. George's the article is, is very, very good, and as always, and full of interesting little bits of data that I don't pick up anywhere else. Um, but I think that conclusion is is wrong in this instance. Generally speaking, I think he's right. Um, the Greens, for instance, are, are a party of protest, and that, that makes them not all that relevant. Um, but in this case, I, I don't think um, Dutton will come out of it with the Liberal Party as a party of protest um, they are not leading the no vote. They are just fellow travellers with the no vote. Yeah, but they do a bit of a bit of form in the no uh, business, Jack, um, and, as Peter Dutton most certainly has. And we're not just talking about Indigenous politics here. We are talking about this opposition for opposition's sake. And uh, and I, I have a feeling that there may be some consequences around this that will be broader than the referendum. Uh, and um, uh, where I get what what Mega is saying is is where you've got these you know the, the seats of what were traditionally su- supportive of the coalition and the Liberal Party in particular, uh, these now are just being lost by, by further bigger and bigger margins, and that the Liberal Party is trying to shift itself around. It really it's a little bit like Labor ten years ago, Jack. They're not quite sure who their constituency is. That's the yeah. problem I think they've got. Um, <coughs> honestly, honestly, I think Labor still has that problem to some extent, um, uh, and they both do because their their constituencies are switching. Um, but yeah, but I, I, George as always makes some excellent points. But um, I don't think that the voice in itself is going to do that much damage. Um, uh, I think the Liberal Party's um, uh, woes predate. The announcement of the voice, and we'll carry on after the announce after the referendum. Yeah, yeah that's a, that, that, that's where I'm going to. I mean, I, I just I see uh, I, I see this as being a, um, a a real issue for the Liberal Party in terms of who it thinks it represents, and we saw some very odd sort of comments in and around. Peter Dutton's announcement that the Liberal Party would oppose. The yes proposition, uh, where he made some very odd remarks about, you know, we are the party of regional Australia. And you think, no, mate, that's the National Party. So you gotta find, you gotta find your own little demographic there. And if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have a go for out of suburban, uh, mortgage stressed voters, maybe that's a constituency, but you're gonna, you're gonna find a great deal of difficulty. Having turned your back on on the on the blue bloods, um, you're going to find a great deal of difficulty finding enough votes um, 
in the heavily contested outer suburban areas, mortgage belt areas, uh, to win elections into the future. Yeah. Well, well, Labor has certainly handled the tradition a little bit better. What have they've lost? Um, two or three seats to, in inner city seats to the Greens, uh, and, you know, and, and these were stronghold seats. These were <laughs> well last year, yeah, yeah. There was one, and, and well, well, they, two they, they, Queensland, yeah. And, and they lost Melbourne in twenty ten, I think. Yeah, that's um, right. Um, uh, which was um, you know, Lindsay Tanner's seat, um, um, the, the seat I lived in for a long time, um, and it was absolute Labor heartland. Um, um, and the Liberals have lost more of their heartland seats than Labor lost. So they've, they've got some real challenges. Peter Dutton, I think, is doing a better job than anybody else they've got who could do. Um, uh, I, I certainly don't think he's going he's to ride this to the prime ministership because history tells us that doesn't happen. Yeah. But um, And it's a terrible job he's taken on. Yeah, Not, he's the only one to do it. He's yeah, the only, yeah. I mean, he, he might be Mr. No, I think that, that was a... Um, uh, an episode attached to uh, Tony Abbott um, yep. and, and others too, uh, 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 and, but that might be something that really knocks him about. That, having said that, they have no one else with the abilities, the political abilities and the communication skills that Peter Dutton has. Like him or love him, uh, like him or, or loathe him, I should say, um, and, and most most people go with the latter. Um, he's not a fair, he's never going to be a popular bloke, but he's got plenty of bottle. Um, uh, and yeah. he, he, he gets out of bed every morning and goes and does it. And they've got no one else who could do that. Um, uh, uh, oh, credit, credit, credit to him for doing the job. A, I mean, a weaker you, personality would have failed by now. Would have fumbled and 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 been been the subject of a spill by now. That that's my view. If you yeah. had a, a a sort of let's say a Brendan Nelson. Uh, shoveled into the job um, at that time. That, or, that would have moved or, or, against him. Or a John Hewson. Yeah, yeah. So, he, he, you know, he gets up, Peter Dutton, that is. But one thing he does, he has that ability, and it's a fairly rare ability in politics, that ability to deliver a, perhaps a three- or four-second grab every day um, and, uh, and, and doing it in a sort of coherent way. Um, uh, that's a rare skill um, uh, that that he does have. Um, uh, doesn't waffle. tends to, to tends to make his points fairly quickly. Whether you agree with him or not, those are the skills he has. And I don't think his colleagues, uh, any of his colleagues, uh, are, are anywhere near him in that in that respect. No, his job's safe. It's just not going to take him to the prime ministership. Meanwhile, Elbow, I think. Um, he, the, the, the bit of bark's coming off elbow, and he just looks to me like he's a little bit too smug and self-satisfied with getting the job at the moment. And th- this is kind of funny how I, I, I look at past prime ministers, and Gough Whitlam always looked like the job was a little bit small for him, um, uh, really. He was bigger than just being prime minister of Australia. Paul Ke- uh, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating look like, well, I was always going to get this job. It fits me perfectly. John Howard, pretty much the same as that. Um, uh, Kevin Rudd, who knows what Kevin thought, except that he was too smart for everything else. But Elbow looks like, well, he's kind of fallen into the job. No one thought I could get this after, you know, 25 or 30 years in politics, and it looks a bit like that at the moment. He looks like he's a bit smug, a bit self-satisfied, and making some poor choices. We talked about process last week uh, in regard to the Qatar Airways decision, and that's where I think there are some lessons, hard lessons to be learned there for Anthony Albanese. You, yep. you, you believe that he may have had some involvement in that decision. We don't have any evidence of that. But if you lock it away in the cabinet, you don't have any evidence. You just can't find any. That's, that's what should have been done, and w- whichever – Decision was was to reject the Qatari bid or whether to accept it. Having that go through a cabinet process with twenty odd people sitting around the room knocking the burrs off it and asking and reflecting on the political considerations, you would have had probably a better decision made, but you also would have had cabinet solidarity around it, and it would not have become a political controversy. And I would say the same thing about the voice. I, I just can't believe this went through a proper cabinet process because it, it would have had more burrs taken off it as well if it had of. 
And we're not going to know the answer to that. I think it's 20 years before the cabinet papers come out. And if I'm still around in 20 years, I'll be trying to work out how to colour inside the lines, you know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, um, so uh, it's, I won't, I'll never know the answer to that. Well, you, well, you are not going to know that answer, birthday no. boy. No. And I'll be long odds. Uh, <laughs> but but, but, but I, I just think it, had it gone through a proper cabinet process, we would have got a better proposal. Yeah, and, 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 that's, and that's when prime ministers start and, and governments start losing their way. Yes. Uh, and I think if they haven't, I mean, there, are, there are good, smart, efficient operators in there, um, uh, and, and they'll be the ones who say, "Now, nah, this is where we need to. This is where we need to tighten up." Don't know whether you saw Albo last night on the television, where he had to come back into Parliament and correct something he'd said in Question Time, uh, or it might have been at the end of Question Time, um, and it was really something of minor importance. He said that Alan Joyce hadn't been on the VIP plane with him, and then he had to say, "Well, look, Alan Joyce and twenty-five other important business people had got a lift on the plane, and all that sort of stuff." Um, so it really wasn't all that important, except that the it's opposition. Sloppy. Opposition could scream and yell and say, you misled us, all that sort of stuff. You know, it doesn't really go anywhere. That's just sloppy, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, but it's sloppy. But just watching um, uh, Jim Chalmers uh, and a couple of the other uh, cabinet members walk out at the end of that, they didn't look well pleased. Yeah, yeah. Those things are necessary. Um, you can avoid those kinds of – you wouldn't call yep. them scandals. you no. call them brouhaha's, little 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 – Little uh, uh, little hurdles that governments need to get get through, um, and and if you're creating a little bit of controversy, a little bit of a sense of scandal, whiff of scandal, um, uh, you go through your proper cabinet processes, and and the, the best thing I think Anthony Albanese can just say is, just, "I'm just a leader of the team." Yes, that's exactly what you are. You're just the just the captain, first amongst equals. Um, no uh, bloody right. captain's picks either. No, no you captain's picks. You don't get picks. to make so, captain's so, picks. So, so at the moment, I just think he's got to get this back on a little bit more humility. Realise he's just first amongst equals. Get the get the get the ship heading in the right direction again, and he'll be fine. I mean, he's going to win the next election, I'm almost certain. You would think so. And 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 also, look, you, you, he's got a now he booked himself into a, a trip to China, which is. You know, I Good mean, uh, Scott. Well, let, let, let's just examine the the opposition to it. Uh, Scott Morrison got up in the Liberal Party room last week and said uh, uh, that basically Albanese shouldn't be going to China, uh, and um, and it was just uh, a sort of a, a reminder that Scott Morrison's still hanging around like a bad smell. The first that's the first thing, and then the, the it. it also will, will cause Australians to reflect on the nature of that relationship during the Morrison years with Peter Dutton as Home Affairs Minister and Maurice Payne as Foreign Affairs Minister. Uh, uh, Maurice is uh, wandering off into uh, into the sunset uh, in a month or so's time, um, but we had terrible relations and that impacted directly uh, on our exporters and, um, uh, and, and it was just... Um, pig-headedness um, that 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 came from uh, from, from Morrison uh, in particular. Um, uh, I think most Western countries' relationships with China deteriorated that over that time. Morrison just did a worse job than most other people. Yeah, good point. And uh, and of course, uh, Elba was in the Philippines as well, and there's a strategic partnership being created there. So he was able to basically walk away from the Qantas stuff fairly easily, Qantas Qatari stuff. Um, uh, Annabelle Crabb wrote a column late last week saying uh, politics this week begins is brought to you by the letter Q, which was kind of right. I wish I had to come up with that line. Um, um, but um, uh, uh, he's... Uh, his his foreign journeys with Penny Wong not far away, who's a very bright operator, uh, have been very very good, particularly in the regions. Yeah, look, uh, uh, nothing's going terribly badly for the for the for the current Albanese government. It, it, they're like the kid, uh, the, the kid footballer who's got a few cuts and bruises. You patch him up and tell him to go back out there, you know, um, uh, and be a bit more careful next time. That's, just be that's, a bit careful. Yeah, yeah. Don't look. Don't make it look obvious. If you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to 
iron someone out. You yeah. know, make yourself look clumsy, not uh, yeah. Yeah. not vicious. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so that's where they are. I mean, they're not they're in no danger. I don't think at this stage of losing the next election, uh, they just need to get the thing back on the road a bit. And 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 the problem is a little bit at the top. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one, they've had a major victory, Jack. We've been talking about housing for a long time on this program and the problems are therein. And, of course, the Labor Party under elbow went to the last election with a $10 billion housing packet. That was um, rejected by the Greens in the Senate. Um, but with the advent of an extra $3 billion uh, the Greens have folded like Superman on laundry day, as they normally do. <laughs> Someone waves a cheque under their nose. Uh, and, uh, and the National Housing Accord has got through with uh, the Greens still bleating about rental freezes, which is just bizarre to me. I mean, um, it's certainly we could talk about rental freezes when they were going to be effective or not, but it is not the responsibility of the Commonwealth to be, to be issuing no. them. But here we are. We've got the national, uh, the Labor's national housing policy through the Parliament. Now it's uh, a $13 billion exercise. Uh, it calculates an extra 200,000 homes could make rents 4% lower than they would be otherwise. It'll be better than a freeze, isn't it, Jack? I know this is all down the road stuff. Um, and, and, uh, and and whether it will work is another, another question. But yes, yeah. Well, we talk about the problems with housing. See, if, if you have uh, hooked in and bought yourself a dwelling, you've got a mortgage, you've had interest rates climbing up, and then there will be, let's say, low cost social housing in your street or in your neighbourhood. Uh, and you will, and you will see that the valuation of your home is not going to go up. The, the more you deal with the demand side of housing in Australia, the, 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 the valuation of the property that people have put their hard earned, hard earned, their sweat and, and tears into, uh, will actually drop a little bit in value. And uh, that's why housing is really, really a difficult one for for for, for politics or for our political parties to uh, to, to fix. Yeah, no one wants to talk about it. We all know it's true what, what you're saying. I mean, yeah. and no one wants to say this. Say this in public. We all know it's true. We were talking last week briefly about the um, Canadian Conservative Party. How they've now got in front of their of their Liberal. Counterparts, Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party, which is like through, now through a housing Party, policy, yeah, through a housing policy, and I, and I saw, I, mean, I think, not much when I sent it to you, a, a little five-minute video clip their leader um, had done. This, this is this is unusual what they've got in front of the Liberals in the eighteen to thirty-four-year-old group because you'd expect them yeah. to be on the progressive side of politics. Um, you know, in Australia, they vote Green and a bit of Labor. Right? Um, in in Canada, they're proposing to vote Conservative. Um, and and this little five minute clip, he said, "Well, a lot of this is state responsibility, but what we're going to do, and we've worked out how much extra you pay to buy a property or a house or an apartment in Vancouver and Toronto and you know Montreal, etc. How much extra you pay because of the cost of government regulation, red tape, um, zoning approvals, all that sort of stuff. We're going, and we give a lot of money to these cities and regions." And we're going to tie that money. We're going to say you'll get less money unless you reduce the cost of government in building new homes. Um, and I'm not sure where you can make that work, but it's excellent politics. Well, uh, state governments could start looking at some of their um, uh, stamp duty, which is just unbelievably expensive now. Uh, for anyone who wants to buy a home, and let's say so let's let's make a home in regional, uh, an imagine an imaginary home in in regional Australia of about five hundred thousand dollars. First home buyers way into that, and the first thing they've got to pay is, I think, off the top of my hand, nearly thirty grand in stamp duty, Jack. Yes, yeah, that's that, it's just wrong, uh, and, and and then we've got problems with local governments, particularly in the cities. Who are, who are, and particularly in Sydney, you do see more of it in, in Melbourne where you've got medium density housing coming into, you know, in, into the suburbs. Um, and, and, and certainly, you know, inner city 
Melbourne and Sydney have always been a bit the same. There's, there's high density housing there. But as you go out, in Sydney, you've got, you've got people sitting on quarter acre blocks and they want to keep their quarter acres, but, um, uh, there have been all sorts of problems with councils looking at things like dual occupancy, medium density housing, uh, approving units being built, etc. And that's part of the problem that needs to be overcome. It, it, it does. Uh, you know, there, there, there are easy things you can do. I mean, uh, you can build high density, very high density housing around transport hubs. I mean, I mean, Sydney's done that in Chatswood. I mean, Chatswood's like a little piece of Hong Kong. You know, I mean, it's um, you've got a train station with all these towers around. It, it works quite well. Have a look at the inner west. I mean, it's just not there. You know, it, it, it's just not there. Even where you've got this sort of one of the things that you see in in, in Melbourne often is that um, there will be. Uh, commercial and residential developments around railway stations. Yes. And the closer you get to town, there'll be 10 stories. And, and as you get to that sort of um, suburban fringe, it, it becomes four and five stories. Um, I don't know. In, uh, here, here in Hong Kong, our, our transport company is called the MTR. Um, uh, and, and the joke in Hong Kong is because they, they get the air rights, what they call the air rights over all the stations they build. Right. So they can they can whack, up, whack a podium on top of the station and build half a dozen, you know, 84, 70 floor towers on it. Right? Um, and the joke in Hong Kong is the MTRs, it's not really a railway company, it's a property company who dabbles in trains. Right? Um, that, well, you've got developers doing those things now huh? mm-hmm. in, 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 in Victoria. And I guarantee you, you look at any railway station within a 20 kilometre radius of the CBD, and there will be a, either a 10 story development or a five story yep. development. Uh, around that railway station. It's exactly how you've got to do it because it makes it convenient. Um, uh, it, it draws in other development around the railway station. You get supermarkets, you get restaurants, you get cafes, bars, all that yep. sort of stuff. Yep. Yeah, there's a little bit little bit of it going on around Sydney, around Green Square, Mascot, um, and around that airport line. You do see a lot of, uh, a lot of commercial properties. Actually, the sort of apartment style living has declined. I mean, we're now talking about the average price in and around Green Square around nine hundred thousand dollars for a two bedroom apartment. It's a little bit less than it used to be. I keep an eye on those things. Um, something similar would cost you about one point two million around that one uh, a few years ago. There is a bit of an oversupply of, of apartments, but then when you get beyond that's, that, that's, sort that's of just. We're in that property market as well, uh, uh, and that, that's just a temporary thing. It, it, yeah, it'll it come, is. it'll come, it'll come back up again. Yeah, you, yeah, you, right. You've got to take a longer term view. But you're right; there are too many impediments just to trade in houses, and the stamp duty is one of them. There are other ways of raising that money that, rather than um, a, a tax on the transaction. Yeah. Uh, um, you, yeah. you, you, you need to make it easier for people to upsize and downsize as their needs change. All right. Well, National Cabinet, I'm not quite sure of the source. And, and, of- and, and I've got to say, um, uh, the uh, the Jack the Insider Housing Summit would be it, the, these things ought to be discussed, on, you know, out in the open um, at, a, at a housing such summit. It's a huge problem, Jack. It is going to be a problem for governments going forward for decades because you really do have almost a 50 50 split now of people who either have housing. Mm. And, and sometimes multiple houses, and those who don't have them at all and can't get into the market. Yep. Um, all right. Uh, I, I just not, I'm not quite sure of the source of this uh, piece here on on housing here, Jack. Uh, but I did just want to read from it. You might be able to tell me. National Cabinet's blueprint also calls for states to consider the phased introduction of inclusionary zoning, which would force developers to incorporate social and affordable housing in any major project a common practice overseas. The caveat is that this should be done in, and I quote, in ways that do not add to construction costs. That's from a learned paper on the issue, and the author's name escapes me. Okay. No, that's but I fine. Think it, I, think, I think it's quite good. Yeah, no, uh, well, you know, again, this, this, this piece here has is, is, got, you know, a lot of the people involved, the Master Builders Association, uh, uh, the, the Rental Associations, the Grattan Institute, etc. Um, that's what we need, Jack. The, uh, the, 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 the housing summit where you, quite seriously, where you can thrash these things out 
uh, at all government levels. Uh, you have developers, you have the MBA, you have uh, rental uh, associations. Uh, put them all in one room and say, okay, we've got a problem we need to fix. It. Well, that's that's why the, the Hawk um, ACTU Summit right back in the, in 83, I think it was 84, 83, I think, uh, worked because people were in the room and they couldn't hide. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. That's why these things do work. I mean, I know they're often sort of besmirched as being circuses, but they that they, they can work. You can come away well, from them, from negotiate with all parties involved, negotiate a solution. That's really the power of politics. Yeah, uh, un- unlike the, the 2020 summit, was it? I think um, the Kevin Rudd summit. Oh, 2008. 20, 20, uh, wasn't it called the 2020 summit or something? Uh, oh, about, the, yeah, that's right. It was too. And, um, uh, and, which and, was, and, and, but now, and now that we're at 2020, Jack, everything's perfect. Yeah, so uh, well done, Kevin. Yeah, well, uh, that was just a summit. Fact to have because you <laughs> wanted to have a summit. To have a summit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and Kevin got a chance to be sitting down with his notes in front of him, um, with his bum on the carpet. Um, so he looked like he just was, one of the boys. Yeah, you know. he loves to sit cross-legged on the on the floor of a of a, of a parliament. God bless him. Now, Jack, the four day working week. I'll have to I'll have to work a couple extra. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing for that. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what we want. Is it? it look, it, it was embraced in France. Well, no, it, it, it's it's been imposed in France. You've got a four day working week there now, I believe. Um, and yeah, uh, I've, got, I've got a mate who works for a French bank. You know, um, it's, he struggles with a seven week holiday a year. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, God bless him. Uh, and uh, uh, they're hosting the, the World Rugby um, uh, World Cup of Rugby. Uh, and uh, and they're doing a fantastic job, must be so. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, is the four day a work week something that's uh, going to come into Australia? I can't see it, to be honest. Well, the, the, I saw a, a clip last night with the um, from a woman from the Australian Services Union. I can't remember which one they used to be. Um, they all change their names all the time these days. But they've come up with what they call the 180 100 model. Uh, and the idea is that. You get 100% of your previous pay for 80% of the work time with a commitment to 100% productivity. Okay. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you commit to 100% productivity, Jay? Or, I, I think no, you can commit to it. That's, easy, that's the easy part. Yes. But how do you do it? How do you produce it? That's that's the tricky bit, isn't it? You know, uh, 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 it'll, it'll be interesting, interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, I, I think you, you know people do like more flexible work hours. There's no doubt about that. They like a little bit of give and take in uh, when they can get some time off, particularly with people with young families, etc. Yeah, uh, and, and, and uh, people are working sort of odd, sort of seven days on, seven days off, that sort of thing as well. Uh, you know, particularly in emergency services, policing. Yep, those sorts of things. So there, there is that sort of work, and it's always interesting. I think you know when you when you go to perhaps a shopping centre on a Monday or a Tuesday, and you see a lot of people doing their shopping and things like that that they might have always done on the weekends, but now they've got the whether it's an RDO or whatever it is. The nature of work has changed. It's really because it's such an important part of our lives. Work. Um, we. I never understand why we're so reluctant to talk about these things. These, the, 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 these things, we've got some industrial relations reforms, which we probably should address next week, Jack, from Tony Burke. Um, yeah. Uh, and we will. Um, but the nature I, of work I, I just itself. Ha- I just hadn't read it before I could put it in the document. <laughs> it's about, eight, about it's 800, 800 pages. About 480, <laughs> I think. And, uh, yes, I haven't, I hadn't uh, trawled through it yet, but we will. We will do it for our listeners. Um, but, um, yeah, we should be talking about work all the time. Um, uh, well, not all the time, but we should be talking about it a, a lot more than we do um, because it's such a huge part of our lives and how we might be, one, better, uh, better at our work, more productive, uh, and, and how we might get that work-life balance, which is a bit of a cliche, but help me out here, uh, that work-life balance a little bit better. Yeah, I think um, as a society, we probably should talk about that. But as individual workplaces, people need to work on that a bit. I mean, some places, some jobs lend themselves more to this than others, obviously, you know. And, uh, 
Uh, uh, yeah, they do. They do. Um, and um, you know, if, you, if, if you're a barrister running a case, you can't tell the judge, "Look, I've done my four days for the week, so we're not sitting tomorrow." You know, <laughs> well, and, uh, the, judge, the judge, but the judge had probably already pulled the pin on the Friday anyway, Jack. Uh, I can we will uh, we will reconvene here on Monday morning. In, in a different era, it doesn't happen these days. They're much more strict. But I can recall uh, being in court on an Oaks Day in Melbourne um, uh, on in, in Cup Week um, uh, Thursday morning, and we were the, the, the second case up. The case in front of us fell over, and we're ready to go. And uh, the judge says, are you ready to go? And, we, and our boys are all saying, yes, yes, of course, Your Honour, we're ready to go, but we might have a small problem with the witnesses. <laughs> and, and the judge says, oh, I can't have that. Shall we say 10.30 tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and all, and all were, Was the judge at the Oaks as well? Uh, the judge was there as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving uh, overseas now. Uh a Ken Biden win in 2024. The polling saying no, he can't. I think he's. I think he's trailing. Uh, uh, he's trailing Trump by points, only a couple of points. But but he's also he's also trail, uh, trailing uh, uh, Nikki Haley. He's basically anyone on the uh, the GOP uh, primary even, ticket even at the Chris- moment. Even Chris Christie, he's behind Chris Christie in a day. Well, uh, Democrats love Chris Christie. Republicans can't have can't have him yeah, at all. Yeah. But, but 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 Democrats love him because he because he sinks the slipper into Trump. Um, is this the way it's going to be? Is, is uh, we we are looking at uh, a situation in in twenty twenty four. It's going to be very very messy with Trump's uh, multiple indictments, in, including one that goes right through. In, uh, I think either um, uh, right up to Super Tuesday, um, which is I think uh, the, you know the, the day when uh, the primaries, a, a vast number of states that, uh, uh, have their primaries. Um, it, it, so you've got Trump on one side, and then you've got Biden on the other, and it's like no one really wants either of these people. No, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, um, uh, had, had a poll: seventy-five percent, seventy-three percent of Americans, not just you know, not bipartisan, don't think he's mentally up for the job. Um, and the New York head, New York Times had a headline: uh, "Why is Joe Biden unpopular?" And when the New York Times start turning against a, a Democrat president, um, they're generally in a bit of trouble. Is it just his age, though, Jack? I mean, when we look at what he's done as president, it's not its not a bad legacy. Um, the, the, the people don't seem to agree with you. Um, uh, the worst bit of it, perhaps the worst bit of the polling is that, um, uh, is that the, the voters don't think that he has a record of accomplishment. 40% think he has a strong record of accomplishment. Fifty-one um, percent think Trump has a strong record of accomplishment. Well, he's doing it. He <laughs> mm-hmm. had one significant piece of legislation go through, and the rest was basically just a COVID nightmare. Um, uh, but, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, uh, I'm not are, saying that. Are these things going to turn? Are these uh, things uh, going to turn for him? Because they're locked in. I mean, Biden leads the primary polling uh, for the Democrats by the length of the straight. Um, yeah, and as does Trump lead the Republican, not the, the, the general voters don't want them, but their parties seem to be sticking with them. That's true. Look, it's, we need to move on, but I just want to ask you, Jack. This is a major speculator. Now we know if if Trump goes down in Georgia, he, he's looking at five year minute, uh, minimum mandatory uh, sent jail sentence, and then there there are the other three uh, criminal indictments. As well, the strongest, I believe, uh, it, 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 well, according to the Wall Street Journal, is the classified document stuff. Uh, the strongest case against him, according to uh, a, according to what was published in the Wall Street Journal. If he goes to jail, where are they going to put him? <laughs> well, he's, in, he's entitled to Secret Service protection. So, does he go into the jail with Secret Service people beside him? <laughs> I was thinking about this last night. Hmm. They'll have to find it. He could make jail great again. Um, he he could. Make, he'll have his own. He may well have his own jail. Yeah, Mar-a-Lago. Um, 
<laughs> just put some razor ribbon around it. Oh, and, you know, put, I put, a, put a different flag at the front. That'll do. Yeah. <laughs> it's got all sorts of logistical problems, uh, I yeah, imagine. But, so, but, but he, he, is, he is going to remain entitled to his Secret Service protection. So how do you do that when he's in charge? Oh, yeah, there's lots of <laughs> no one's moving forward. Going to be a very, very messy year mm. uh, in the United States. But it will be fun. No, uh, it, it is it is going to be amusing if nothing else. Now we're talking about Joe, and and perhaps some of his polling figures is, is driven by his age, um, um, <coughs> and uh, and and uh, perceived mental incapacity, Jack. Um, but it seems like there's a bit of a problem uh, throughout uh, uh, through, <laughs> throughout the Congress of a similar type, Jack. Yeah, um, uh, I think we probably most of us saw the Mitch McConnell uh, freezing inc- incident where he was couple of times, a couple of times, frozen, uh, and it's almost like watching a man have a stroke. Now it wasn't a stroke, but it, 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 it doesn't look good. It, it certainly could have passed for one. Um, uh, and 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 <laughs> there was a, I saw an interview with uh, Gavin Newsom, um, uh, and he's talking about Diane Feinstein, the um, senior. Senator from California, uh, and, and he probably thought he was doing a favour, um, but he, 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 what he said was uh, that he, he was in touch with her personally not that long ago, uh, and, but and now he's dealing with the staff. And you think, well, that's okay, but that's an indication that she can't, she can no longer do the job, mm-hmm. and the staff, the staff are doing the job for her. And, um, and the reason why she she remains there and doesn't retire. Um, Overtly, anyway, is that uh, that would lead to a uh, well, we call it a by election, although the Americans don't, uh, that the Democrats may not win, Jack. Well, no, he, he, he would be able to appoint a replacement senator. Um, Gavin Newsom could report, could appoint a oh. replacement senator. You know, re- remember, um, uh, the Illinois governor went to jail um, uh, over trying to do a deal um, when Barack Obama. Um, a seat yes. became vacant. Um, uh, uh, Blago, I can't think, Blagovich, I think his name yes. was. Uh, yes. and, uh, Did a decent uh, job too. Uh, yeah, and I think well, he, he just joined, I think, every other um, uh, Illinois governor in the last three or four all went to jail. It seems to be a, um, it's a retirement plan, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, um, we're just, uh, uh, we'll, we'll go back to some of these hot topic issues just in a minute, Jack, but I just want to explain that. Uh, we to our listeners that we were going to do a more detailed thing on Ukraine and Russia. It's really something that we're watching very carefully. We want to give you an update on where the uh, uh, the the uh, the counter offensive is. Ukraine's counter offensive is uh, it's slow is all we can say, but they're looking uh, and they'll need to get a need to get a crack on because uh, winter will be. Uh, winter will arrive very, very shortly uh, in eastern Ukraine. Um, but we'll give you a proper update on that as we go. Um, but in the meantime, Jack, um, uh, the G20 has just uh, uh, convened and just concluded, uh, and uh, it was acknowledged in statement there that there were different views and assessments of the situation among the G20 nations, Jack. On whether, uh, basically, well, the basis for a negotiated settlement uh, and uh, and support for Putin's Russia more generally. Yes, uh, one of the, the final statements say: all states must refrain from the threat or use of force to seek territorial acquisition. Um, no mention, no specific mention of of Russia. Um, uh, and, the, and the statement acknowledged that there were different views and assessments of the situation. So, you know, the Ukrainians are not happy with that, but um, that's a that's the reality of the situation with the group of the twenty group of twenty um, um, industrialized countries that they don't all agree on this. Yes, um, uh, we're going to sort of ask those sort of, ask those sorts of questions coming in the weeks ahead. You know, can there be a negotiated settlement here, or should there be a negotiated settlement uh, for a country that invades another one and attacks its civilian population and continues to do so? So we will catch up with that very, very soon. Now, have you ever written a character reference for anybody, Jack? 
Uh, I have. I've done a, a few, yeah. yeah I've done yeah, a few. Yeah. Well, it didn't kind of pan out for Ashton Kutcher and um, Mila Kunis uh, uh, this week. Uh, they had had to apologise for writing character references for Danny Masterson, who was convicted of raping two women in May and sentenced wow, to 30 years in a 30 to life. Court. Yeah, yeah, he's not getting out. We won't be seeing him round no more. Uh, famously a Scientologist too, Jack, and uh, much of the prosecution case was based on the fact that uh, uh, the victims, who are also Scientologists, were discouraged from reporting uh, the offending by Masterson until many, many years later when they'd left the cult. Um, but sure, sure, I mean, interesting comment on this on 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 Twitter. Um, this is subject to an internet frenzy, so it's pointless to come in behind the well, actually, gag. But uh, there is a common misconception which impacts clients trying to get character references in the real world that a character reference equals implicit downplaying of offending. But one of the main roles of character reference is to provide context of character, whether now or at the time of offending. It's a legal document. You can't lie to the court in a reference. Um, you could say, well, they shouldn't have done it because it sent a bad message to the victims. Um, but you, you, people need to be able to get a character reference, I think. Um, absolutely. There was and, f- and, and, and it doesn't mean you think they're innocent. It just means this is what I know of the person. There was the rather um, famous uh, case in Australia where uh, Tony Mockbell, um, a, a massive drug dealer and organised crook, uh, received <laughs> received a character reference uh, from a Labor politician, Jack. Um, I, I can't recall which politician it was, and I'm uh, uh, member for Wills. Um, uh, member for Wills, who took over after Independent Phil Cleary um, uh, got role. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of his name now too, but uh, clearly it was one of those things where his electoral staff had uh, just undertaken. To uh, to do without doing too many checks without uh, getting the uh, uh, getting the the reference done and probably just plonked it in front of his nose and he signed it. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, don't, I haven't done them willy nilly, but I've been quite happy happy to do them for people who um, who I as to whose character I was satisfied, which didn't mean that I thought that they were innocent of what they were going up there for. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the uh, look. We haven't seen um, the uh, the references that uh, Kushner and his uh, and his. Oh, and I've, I've 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 read the Kushner one. Oh yeah, what what what, what was it? Was it, ex- it was it accepting of his guilt? No, it didn't. It didn't address the issue. Nor, mm. nor would nor, nor would you nor would you you expect it to. I wouldn't have that either. Um, uh, and it did talk about uh, in glowing terms about having spent twenty five years. Um, as a friend of uh, Danny Masterson and having worked with him closely, and he was quite a bit older than Kusha when they the started. Older brother relationships. The older brother relationships, mm, how, he, how Masterson had kept him um, off the, on the straight and narrow away from uh, becoming in the, in the indulgences of Hollywood, had kept him away from becoming a substance abuser, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was a perfectly good uh, character reference. Yeah. Um, and... It, it obviously didn't change things at all, did it? No. I mean, uh, Masterson received 30 to life, um, and uh, from what I understand of the nature of the, the rapes, who were dragging and raping women, um, uh, uh, that that sentence, well, it's certainly at the, it, it's certainly at the pointy end, isn't it? Well, it, it, it wasn't light. I can think we can safely say. That. I mean, it's very hard to comment on sentences when you haven't seen the evidence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, uh, it, it, it certainly doesn't seem like he was um, given a light touch sentence, does it? No, indeed, and uh, has major consequences for uh, Scientology. Uh, in 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 Australia and in the United States, there the, there are three Australians who are former cult members of Scientology who have uh, brought a suit in Florida against uh, what's called the Church of Scientology. It likes to call itself that, 
um, and, and uh, am, among the claims is uh, put the human trafficking jack. So uh, hmm. we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, uh, the, uh, the Scientology boss, Miss Cabbage, David Miss Cabbage, uh, has, has gone missing, a little bit like his wife, and um, and uh, was presumed by a magistrate in the Florida court system, uh, legal system, to have been served. He would he'd sort of gone underground, dodging process service. That was what uh, that was what uh, <coughs> the plaintiff's uh, legal counsel was saying. Uh, Scientology, for what it's worth, denied that that was the case. Um, Florida, I think Florida's now their headquarters. They own, um, it's just near Tampa. They own a whole green, little, little city there. Yeah, um, um, that, that's that's right. They also have a fairly substantial um, uh, uh, presence here, and and, uh, and that largely was driven by the High Court's judgment in what nineteen eighty three, I think, Jack. Yeah. Uh, uh, that uh, that allowed them that allows them to call themselves a church here. Uh, I think banned in Germany and uh, have no tax exempt status in the UK. Wherever they have no tax exempt status, they just don't have any presence whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> organ donors, uh, Jack, in Singapore, uh, you register as, a, as an organ donor automatically. If you're over the age of 21 and opting out, you can opt out, but it results in you being put at the bottom of the organ priority list if you ever need a transplant yourself. What do you think of that system? I like it. Uh, I, I think it's quite good myself. Um, I, I can't imagine there'd be a queue around the door for my organs, but. Um, uh, well, well uh, not a man of your, you know, vintage. Definitely not, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and 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 they're well they're one, well run in. I one, can tell you. <laughs> one user, but he had them for a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, but yes, of course. Look, you know, this is a very serious conversation to have. We have very very low rates of 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 organ. Um, uh, donation in this even, country. Even worse here in Hong Kong, almost, almost, it's very hard to get them all together. And it's just a reminder to our listeners: if you've ticked the box on your lot on your driver's license, that's not enough. Hmm. You have to go, and we'll pop this up uh, on uh, the ship posting website, just as an encouragement uh, on the CPR website of the Facebook page. Um, uh, the, the process that you need to go through: um, there's a government department. Uh, was a sub department of the Department of Health. Uh, we'll pop the link up there, and it will literally take you fifteen seconds um, to become a donor that way. That's the way you do it. Uh, as you, as you quite rightly point out, Jack, you, yours and my organs. Well, I got a few there that I didn't start with. Um, <laughs> so, so, I don't know how that works out, but uh, yours and mine not, might not be any good. But uh, I, and politically, it's a good thing. I just, I, I just basically, I mean, you know, when I say politically, it's a it, personally, it's a good thing to do. Uh, makes you feel good. I don't know. My organs would be uh, people jumping up and down uh, uh, for, for 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 a bit of my lung uh, or a bit of heart or whatever it is, but um, um, it uh, it is a good thing to do. And look, you can just save so many lives. We we, we looked at this in the, uh, in the conditional release program where there was a bit of a, an uproar over a woman who um, uh, uh, was was not on the list because she refused a vaccine. She refused. Influenza vaccine, not just the COVID vaccine, and there are a whole other a lot of issues that the, that the protesters didn't uh, didn't uh, choose to recognise. But um, uh, it just when I was looking at all of that, it just showed me just how low our donation levels are, and as we saw with the mushroom poisonings, Jack, just how difficult it is to get a liver. Um, uh, when, when when one is absolutely crucially needed, um, the sole survivor of of the poisoning event there is believed to be recovering with his liver, um, a wonderful organ, uh, a wonderful organ that can actually regenerate the only one in the body that can. Uh, <coughs> um, but um, yeah, just as, it's just, just one of those well, things we just, need to jack it up. It's just as well they can regenerate as my my. Well, yeah, well, there comes a point where they can't, uh, and that's what's called uh, cirrhosis, Jack. Um, yeah, now, on to sport. Um, and we've got, uh, we've got a little bit of, uh, 
We might as well kick it off with the AFL, Jack. We've got a little bit from our dear friend Lawrence, our farming mate down there, who uh, is not – I think his union's his go, um, but um, – uh, he, he just wrote in to tell me, your boys in blue got the job done last night. Uh, that's, for, that, that's for any of our listeners who haven't worked out the Shrikarden fan. <laughs> yeah, there won't be too many of them. I, I, I don't watch much, much AFL, Lawrence says, and was surprised to see the blasé attitude to incidental head contact in the game. How long before the AFL had a class action like the one against World Rugby in the UK? Well, we've got a couple on at the moment. It has meant the laws of rugby have been tweaked, so head contact that previously may have been called accidental incidental is now careless attracting the penalty. Well, this leads us into the uh, Maynard Brayshaw event on the Thursday night, Jack. Did you yep. see the incident? I did. What did you think? Um, I, I thought um, having had the experience of sitting on a tribunal, that's not a tribunal I'd want to sit on. Uh, it's going to be really difficult. It's firstly, tricky. firstly, Angus Brayshaw has a long history of concussions. He's, yeah. he, he wears a helmet, although uh, those who think uh, just uh, popping a helmet on uh, will uh, will spare people from concussion it's, just doesn't work that way. It's just a minor preventative measure. Um, so he's got a long history of, of concussions. He may not play again this year. Melbourne play Carlton on the Friday night, um, but if they <laughs> proceed into the preliminary final, I doubt that he would be available in that second week. And then we've got Maynard, who objectively went and ran at the player, hands up, looking to smother either a hand pass or a kick from Brayshaw. Uh, Brayshaw got the ball off, and Maynard was committed. He was up in the air. And he made contact with uh, Brayshaw's head with his shoulder. Um, automatically, he goes to the tribunal, and uh, his penalty is likely, if found guilty, his penalty would likely be three weeks, and he would miss miss the rest of the season. And uh, the, there, the, is the an, AF, there is an the appeals AF, process. But go on. The, the AFL have got themselves into a little bit of a pickle with this, I think, because. They've tried to make um, the process a bit too scientific. They've got these standards, you know, of uh, careless, et cetera, indifferent, whatever. Um, uh, and I don't know how well that works. That locks you into a, um, uh, a formula. And I, d I don't think in these situations formulas work. You look at that and two people can look at that and come to – Quite yep. different conclusions. Oh, it, One, these arguments are happening across Melbourne and Victoria a lot. All, right all, now. All, the, all the old footballers, and there's a variety of opinions. Most of them think, "Well, it's just a bit of bad luck." Um, but uh, that's only a, a narrow, ma narrow, narrow majority. There's plenty of people who say, "Well, look, um, I think Dermot Broughton, who knows a bit about taking players out, um, he put a." reasonably well when he said I think I'm quoting him right look he tried to smother the ball but thought look if he could inflict a little bit of harm on the way through yeah, that was okay that. Yeah. Um, and, and that came pretty close to the truth to me I've got to say yeah it's a really tough one uh, for the AFL I mean, they are dealing as all sporting contact sports codes uh, are going and looking at now with a concussion type injury issues with CTE etc it's got that to consider and it's got natural justice to consider the tribunal must take into account Jack you talk about these gradations the, the, the tribunal must take into account the um, the MRP uh, the MRP's classifications and then they will make a determination overtly it should be three weeks it reminded me a little bit of the Patrick Cripps incident last year where Cripps got off on appeal, uh, where there was clearly head contact. Um, um, but uh, they, uh, the appeals, what did he go? He got, he got two weeks and it was, it was overturned. If um, I was sitting on an old fashioned tribunal without these formulas, um, uh, I would say oh, it's a week. 
Um, uh, it, three weeks is too much because he, he didn't say – it wasn't a situation where he set out to harm the player. The harm was, as Breton, I think, quite rightly says, he wasn't in – he was quite okay to give him a bit of a clip as he went past, but it wasn't a deliberate um, uh, punch or anything like that. So three weeks too much, a week's about right. And Jack Martin, the Carlton Ford, a very, very important player at the Carlton Football Club, I think he thought it was 1979 again, didn't he? Um, well, I was I was watching this with a couple of blokes from Melbourne who I vaguely know in the pub with the sound down, as we always do. And uh, as soon as it happened and they flashed back and showed us the replay, the bloke next to me turned around and says, two weeks? I said, yeah, probably. <laughs> Yeah, yeah look, look, look like one or two. I was hoping they will go to an appeal. They will go to appeal, appeal too, and, and, and they're looking and, to get and, him and off back it. by one, but they won't yeah, get him off. Yeah, you <laughs> won't get him off. It looks like a week. Um, um, uh, you know, maybe two. You know, very important play for Carlton. Just really gets gets that uh, hard. That, that forward line very, very hard. He will be probably replaced by uh, Jack Silvani. Now, Jack, take us through the World Cup. Uh, and I want to hear your tips. We've started now. Australia played Georgia. I saw my good mate Steve Canaan at the ABC. He's turned up and done the report from the ground. He's gone. He put the hand up and said, I'll do this. I'll do this story. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love it. Uh, as, as, as you would. As you, uh, yeah, as you must. Yeah. Um, look, it's uh, uh, the French beat the All Blacks pretty comfortably at Stade de France in the opening match of the tournament. Um, South Africa beat Scotland pretty easily. England beat Argentina, which should put them through to the quarterfinals. Um, the Wales Fiji game has been the cracker so far. Um, yeah, very it, close. It went, it went Wales right down to the went, went right down to the wire. Eighty first minute, the Fijians um, uh, a couple of meters out from the Scottish line um, eventually throw the ball wide. Um, their wingers out there, the try lines wide open. And he knocks it on, um, and that would have that try would have got the match for Fiji. Watching the game because they're in the same pool, Wales and Fiji are in the same pool as the Wallabies, and only two can go through. Watching the game, I had my doubts that the Wallabies could beat either of them. I've got to say. Um, well, well, in terms of world rankings, Ireland are number one. Yep, uh, and France number two. But they, my understanding is that they will uh, meet in the quarters quarterfinals anyway. Uh, well, the, the two the two top pools A and B, um, a pool A has France and the All Blacks who will go through. Uh, pool B has um, uh, Ireland and South Africa, and they're the top four ranked teams um, uh, in the world. Um, so only two of those will go past the quarterfinal. Only two of the top four will go into the semifinals. Here's your tip. Um, uh, I still think France will win it. Yeah, I think France will win it too. And we were talking about how well it's been organised. Even the minor games, like Australia v Georgia, were sold out at big stadiums. Yeah, um, a, a bit of a shambles on the ground, um, uh, from what I can tell. Um, uh, getting in and out of stadiums is, is a bit of a, uh, a bit of a disaster. Um, but look, yeah, it's it, it's all going rugby is huge pretty, in France right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. Uh, uh, the, the President Macron um, uh, got a wonderful reception at the opening game. Did he? Um, uh, I think all 70,000 people at the Stade de France were doing him at the same time. Uh, <laughs> uh, good stuff. Uh, yes, I think I think France will win the tournament as well. So and, love and a little, the, P, uh, love the, a little the, PR photo with, I think, Air France, where the, 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 the French front row were, were just walking amongst normal-sized people and they just looked like giant little posters. Well, air hostesses and so forth around them, and they just look like <laughs> they look like giants. I mean, people they were people they were with didn't look like dwarves; they looked like toys compared to the very big boys. Um, watching the uh, uh, the All Blacks um, uh, France game, uh, the All Blacks have definitely come off the pace a little bit. Um, uh, the best comment I saw on that was, "They're still a great attacking team, um, but uh, Ireland." France and South Africa all do the basics of rugby better than New Zealand now. I think that's pretty true. Yeah. So they're going to need a bit of luck, the Kiwis. Um, NRL, Jack, uh, we had, uh, um, uh, well, we, we've got this week the, the two games like the AFL, uh, Storm 
will play the Roosters at home. Roosters had a very good win against the Sharks. In fact, the Sharks probably will be kicking themselves. I think they just dropped off at the wrong time. Uh, the Roosters are coming, though, so so they're half a chance to beat the Storm, who were terrible against Brisbane. Brisbane through to the prelim. And the Warriors, the exciting Warriors, uh, will play the Knights in New Zealand um, uh, over the weekend uh, to determine who they will play in the prelim. Well, some great finishes. Some great finishes. The Newcastle finish was true. Yeah. Uh, although I said, I believe there's been an allegation of biting you. There was. There was a bit of a moment there, and uh, the, the camera got very close and saw that there were bite marks on a player's wrist. Um, I'm not sure where that goes now. That would presumably be, be taken up by their judiciary, not their tribunal, uh, with a bit of a look at that. But if... Uh, uh, rugby league is anything to go by in years past. Uh, in the finals, they'll just kind of wave it through. The, 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 the allegation would be made against a, um, a, a Raiders player. Um, but, um, yeah, I think they'll come up with all sorts of uh, theories about uh, bite reflexes and all sorts of things, and we'll just wave it on through. Well, come away, come away with a recommendation that the water boys carry one of those little sachets of food that they, they have on the <laughs> sidelines out to uh, anybody who gets a bit peckish. You know? well, the, well, the player, is, the player um, who's alleged to have bitten uh, will be playing for South, I think, next year. And um, if he, if there is any action taken and um, and he does have to front the judiciary and, you know, and does get found guilty, then he'd be looking at a fair old holiday. I don't think South would be all that pleased with it. Um, be looking at six to eight minimum, I would think, for a biting offence. Um, mm. So where does that leave us, Jack? I see uh, Australia absolutely belting South Africa in the cricket at the moment. It's just off. On the time, it just doesn't work for me. The 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 T Twenty start about four o'clock in the morning, um, but we've seen uh, Dave Warner got a hundred um, in the in the uh, the ODI against South Africa, just beaten, just just completed, as did Marnus Labuschagne, who wasn't even in the squad of fifteen when they started the tour. Yes. Yeah, going very nicely. And you did promise us some racing tips, Jack. What do you got there? Well, not tips, but at least a bit of a guide to what's going on there. Uh, the early Melbourne Cup favourites, uh, the, the, the favourite at the moment is a horse called Vorban. I think it's a Willie Mullins horse. It's actually a hurdler. Um, uh, but all the international Where's horses. Where's that from? Where's that from? From, from? It's actually a French horse, but trained in Ireland. Right. Um, um, but has a terrific record over the hurdles, mainly on soft going. So we'll see how he goes. Well, it'll, um, it'll go the two miles, put it that yeah, way. Absolutely will go the two miles. Um, there's one called Desert Hero, who's about third in line for the betting, who's actually owned by the King and Queen um, of Australia as well as the United Kingdom. Oh, 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 okay. Um, but the ones, to, the ones that have impressed me so far, Mr. Brightside, Sunshine in Paris, trained by the wonderful Annabelle Nishin, um, who had uh, – when she was working for Kieran Ma, I was looking after one of ours. Um, and a thing, a New Zealand mayor called Imperatives, they've been the, the impressive winners to date. And if you're looking for uh, Imperatrice, um, uh, soft going on Melbourne Cup Day, if that's the go, you know, start looking at your New Zealand horses. Yep. Uh, well, she'll, she'll, she might even go to the Everest. Um, and Sunshine in Paris has just been put into the Everest, uh, just been given a slot in the Everest. Um, so we never had a mayor win the Everest, but um, Sunshine in Paris, not all that heavily raced, not all that experienced, but broke the track record last Saturday. So. Well, well, there you go. We'll keep uh, you up to date there as the Spring Carnival progresses. Now, Jack, take us out with something insane. Uh, two things, really. Um, uh, the <laughs> the opera bodies, uh, opera, uh, symphony orchestra, etc., um, are offering thing called mob ticks. Uh, you get discounts of up to one hundred and seventy dollars um, uh, for the uh, elite ballet, musical, arts, cultural, and sporting bodies and institutions. If you can say that you are Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, Maori, Pacific Islanders, or other First Nations people, I thought that was sort of kind of a bit patronising, really, myself, uh, but amusing, nevertheless. Um, meanwhile, in the United well, States... Well, they've been heavily... Well, all, these, all these cultural events have been heavily sponsored. We subsidised. Yeah, subsidised by the taxpayer, anyway. About, about time they started handing out a few free tickets. 
yeah, 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 for years. Um, uh, meanwhile, in the United States, um, uh, they've actually done, a, they've done research on this. Uh, it turns out that if you stop labelling your food uh, vegan, more people will order it and choose it. Um, oh, and I would, I would, I would have thought that was self-evidently true, um, but they did, they did a six-month to a, to a, might have been a year study to prove this was true. And I thought a bit of basic common sense yeah, might have told them. Didn't, probably didn't need that study. Uh, I mean, I think that, I, I mean, someone was talking about plant-based food, and you know, I, I follow this guy it's, on Instagram who gets around all the sort of big takeaway places and and then restaurants and other things and. He's very, very amusing, and um, and he was on the plant based uh, hamburgers and uh, chicken burgers and things like that from one particular uh, from one particular retail outlet. And he said they were fantastic. I've never given it a go. A go. I, I did try uh, plant based ice cream, and it was awful, just dreadful. Um, the the um uh, a few years ago, people were telling me how this was going to take over the world and the best investment you could make was in the plant-based meat companies. Um, they're all in the toilet. Um, uh, they're all losing money. Um, and, and the simple answer for that is if you turn over the product and look at the list of ingredients, you wouldn't touch it. Oh, dear. Well, I do know one bloke who really did knock himself around. <laughs> you know, he was a, a, a celebratory fellow. And uh, and he's on the plant based stuff now exclusively, and he says he never felt better. And yeah, well, you you, too. You, you 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 pick up a a bottle of almond milk or oat milk and look at the back of it; it's got half a dozen ingredients, um, uh, and none of them you've ever heard of before. <laughs> who would who who would choose that? No, fair enough. All right. Well, that takes us out today uh, for the when the two jacks. Uh, we were very very grateful for readers' contributions. Listeners' contributions, not readers' uh, contributions uh, for this particular show. So please keep them coming. You can drop me a line on uh, at Jack the Insider, um, uh, uh, which is I think it's what, what's the official thing X, formerly known as Twitter. You'll get me on my DMs there, uh, and, uh, and and a number of people are hitting me up through Facebook uh, Messenger and all that sort of stuff through the conditional release program. Anyway, you like folks, and Jack, you can get hold of Jack. By hitting him up on his Substack. What's that, Jack? Hongkongjack.substack.com. It'll so, always be Twitter to me, I think. Yes, indeed. Uh, look, uh, yes, yeah, so there are no excuses, listeners. So, so drop us a line and let us know what you think. Uh, if there's something that you'd like us to address or you've got some comment or criticism, please drop us a line. And with that, birthday boy, we will. Uh, Lead you out so you can go and uh, you can go and embrace the day and sink a few lagers later on. I'll have a couple and then possibly even go after a feed. There you go, mate. Well done. All right. Thanks very much, Lisa. And we'll see you next week. Bye now.